This week on the Retirement Quick Tips podcast, I'm talking about the best investment accounts for grandchildren. Now, tomorrow I'm going to talk about custodial accounts. These are UTMA or UGMA accounts for minors. These are popular vehicles for grandparents to save for their grandchildren, but they have some, some real and important drawbacks. Like the fact that once junior reaches adulthood, which could be any time between 18 and 25, depending on what state, that money is theirs. And guess what? They can blow it on anything that they like. I've seen this happen. It's not pretty. I once had a client who she didn't have a large nest egg or large net worth, but she set aside money for her grandson and a couple other grandchildren as well in these types of UTMA or UGMA accounts. In Oregon, where I live, the age of majority where the minor can access the funds is 18. So, I mean, I think this kid called on his 18th birthday because he knew about the account. He wanted to access the funds. There wasn't a ton of money in there, but it was enough. And she had worked hard and saved that money. And there's probably like, I don't know, $20,000 in there. So he liquidated the account, took the money out and bought a car for his girlfriend. I mean, that is what you want to avoid. So if you want to maintain control and flexibility, one of the best ways to do that, I talked about this yesterday, you could set up a trust account where it really restricts the access and what what the money can be used for. And I talked previously about 529 accounts, which are earmarked for qualified education expenses. So again, I think most grandparents and parents want to avoid giving their young teenager, 20 something, free access to a lot of money. So we want to restrict that. And one of the best ways, if you're not going to set up a 529, if you're not going to set up a trust account, rather than setting up one of these custodial accounts that gives them free access, I think one of the best ways is something that's often overlooked is to simply keep the assets in your name and in your accounts, and then you can gift it later. Now, you could argue that this is not the most tax efficient way to gift, but I think tax efficiency often is secondary to maintaining that type of control to disperse the funds as you please. I'm a very sort of type A, I like organization. So, you know, you could earmark money, you can set aside a specific account, put that money in there. Maybe you give a little, put, set some money aside in there, let it grow, or you could just keep it in your own accounts. And then you could dole out gifts as the opportunity arises and as as you want to do that. And that way there's not some like expectation, entitlement, because again, that's not their money that they can do whatever they want with. They have to ask and their reason has to be good enough in order to get access to the funds. So I know there are pros and cons with all of these approaches, but like I said, I think flexibility and control is paramount. Now, I've talked about trust, which also work well for maintaining flexibility and control. But the reality is, is that lifetime giving and what you want to give or what you end up giving grandchildren, especially, is probably going to be somewhat limited. Most of you listening, especially over your lifetime, you're not going to be giving a million dollars away to your grandchildren. You might give $10,000 here to help pay for a wedding, maybe $20,000 here for helping with a down payment on a house. So most of you, I would guess, are going to end up giving $100,000 or less for various things over your grandchild's life and over your life, college, wedding, down payment, et cetera. Now, even that's a stretch for most people. Most people, in fact, many of you listening, even $100,000 sounds excessive with what you can afford to give or what you'd be willing to give. And so that's why I like the idea of maintaining control over the assets. Ask yourself first, how much do I desire? How much can I afford to give to grandchildren while they're young, over their lifetime, over my remaining life, before we get to the estate questions that come up after death? So if you want to maintain control of the assets, keeping them in your name and just gifting periodically when the opportunity or need arises, I think is a pretty simple and effective strategy. Now, in 2024, the gifting limit before that gift becomes subject to tax filing and other implications is $18,000. So you could give, let's say if you have five grandchildren, you can give $18,000 to each of those grandchildren this year. And you can do the same next year. Every year, it typically goes up a little bit, the amount that you can give. And there's no taxes, no taxes for you, no taxes for them. 
depending on where the money is coming from, of course, if you have to sell assets to do that, those are taxed probably. But if you're just gifting from cash, you know, it's a pretty clean and simple way to go. If you're married, that amount is double. So now you, instead of 18,000, you can give 36,000 per gift recipient. So pretty generous there on what you can gift. You can gift a substantial amount every single year. If most of your gifting is going to fall under this limit anyways, then I'd say, you know, it may not be the most tax efficient way to go. There are other things you can do that will provide other ways of giving this money that would provide more of a tax benefit, but there are trade-offs and one of which is often that you lose control. All right, that's it for today. Thank you so much for listening. My name is Ashley Michikay, and this is the Retirement Quick Tips Podcast.